Who is Martin Heidegger? Why does he matter? And what is the right way to understand his major work? Who is Martin Heidegger? Why does he matter? And what is the right way to understand his work? That is what this public lecture series is going to discuss. So who am I and why does this subject matter matter? Why a course on Heidegger? Why a course in public in this format on YouTube? And what is the argument? So I'm Samuel Longcar. I'm a philosopher who earned my PhD at Yale. My PhD at Yale was written, my dissertation was written on this subject that I'm discussing, Martin Heidegger, in the context of the history of philosophy and religion. And I also work as an editor at Marginalia, where I deal a lot with creating public accessibility of academic knowledge. So that's part of why I'm doing this, is I deeply believe that humanistic discourse and all public discourse that aspires to inform and, and not just represent one position of a partisan party or something like that, that if we want to inform people, we have to be willing to put our ideas into public and work hard to make them accessible. And so I really believe in public philosophy. Um, I publish in conventional scholarly ways, but I also try to make my work as accessible as possible. And so that's partly why I'm doing this. And then I also want to present this argument in this format. And I'll talk about this in detail in the second part of the lecture, but I think that YouTube and the internet in general is obviously a major um, cultural revolution. And cultural and technological revolution should affect the ways in which we practice philosophy and practice scholarship. So I'll discuss some of that. So the first question we'll start with is, who is Martin Heidegger? Why does he matter? And I'm gonna focus really on why he matters. You can look up basic biographical information very easily online. And then we'll discuss why the course in this format, and then we'll discuss what is the nature of my argument. And I want to give you a little teaser. Martin Heidegger's major work that we're going to discuss is a work that he wrote in 1927 called Sein und Zeit. That is the German title of the work. In English, that book is translated in the two major translations by Macquarie and Robinson and a translation by Joan Stambaugh that's been revised. It is translated as Being in Time. The, one of the most perhaps controversial aspects of the argument I'm going to make centers on the following fact that I will prove in the course of this lecture series. The translation of Zion in Sight into English as being in time is a false translation. Um, and I will show that it is a bad translation on general grounds and it's a very bad translation when you understand the specific meaning of the concept of Zion in Heidegger's work. So that's really what this course is going to be about. It's, it's going to be a way of understanding what is the central idea in the title of the book and how it plays out in that book. And then near the end of the course, I will very briefly discuss the evolution of Heidegger's concept of Zion through what scholars call his Kera or his turn. And that will focus on his lecture he wrote late called Über den Humanismus or, over, or about humanism. So that'll be the end course of the lecture. So to begin with, why should you bother learning anything about Martin Heidegger? I'm going to assume, of course, some of you already know who Heidegger is and you might think he's really interesting, but others might be new to Heidegger and you deserve to know why he should be studied. So I want to give you a couple basic reasons to think about. First, there's just Heidegger's reputation. Regardless of what we personally might think of Heidegger, Heidegger's reputation is as one of the most important philosophers in the 20th century. So that means that if we want to understand the values of 20th century philosophy, we have to understand that in those values, Heidegger is considered very important, which means minimally understanding Heidegger is an important task to understanding the values of 20th century philosophy, right? Just like you could say a culture might appoint certain authors to be very important and history might later disagree with whether they were good authors, doesn't change the fact that if you want to understand the time that they were considered to be important, you have to understand those authors. So Heidegger, first of all, is just important to the cultural world of academia and the cultural world of letters. Secondly, the reason Heidegger is considered important, irrespective of what you think about him, is because he was deeply influential. And in this factual sense, it is just the case that he was very important. Heidegger had an enormous influence, not just on German philosophy and academic philosophy, but he influenced a variety of fields in the social sciences and particularly theology and religion in general. And we'll see that there's very deep reasons Heidegger has such a deep um, influence in religion. 
So first, he is just considered important. Secondly, insofar as he was very influential, he is unquestionably important. And a third reason to take Martin Heidegger seriously is because Heidegger's life, which was itself deeply controversial because he was, for example, a member of the Nazi party and an unrepentant member of the Nazi party. So there are unquestionably terrible and very ugly things about Heidegger, but this is a key claim I want to make. Heidegger's course of life is in a deep sense a parable for much of the modern world. And so Heidegger can be read and should be read not as some German extremist, um, some example of sort of unusual bad consciousness or unusual bad ethics. Rather, Heidegger should be read as in a deep sense symbolic of a very profound part of European cultural history. Um, and that is, I think, something that makes people very uncomfortable is whenever you see someone, oh, they were a Nazi, you want to think, oh, they were very unusual. They weren't unusual. Many normal Germans were Nazis. And that's something that has to be understood to understand the cultural significance of intellectuals who consciously sided with the Nazi party. It doesn't excuse anything. In fact, when we understand more deeply what was happening, it can make us have an even deeper judgment but the simple fact is, if we want to think of things that we now regard as heinous and evil, which are heinous and evil, we have to still understand why were they so popular at their own time? What did they mean to people? So this third reason of understanding Heidegger is that, as we'll see, the course of his life says something about the modern world. Now, I'm going to circle back to this question about Heidegger and his importance. But now let me briefly address the second aspect of the course, which is, why discuss Martin Heidegger in this format? Why discuss him sort of from my office um, in public for free? Because I do a lot of teaching and a lot of the teaching I do, I get paid very well for, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, so you could say, why do it in this sort of really informal way? Well, because frankly, we're living through the cultural equivalent of the Protestant Reformation. Okay, I've been involved with media in different ways for a long time, and it's one of my areas of academic interest, but also practical interest because I run an online magazine and a lot of the consulting um, work and writing I've done has to do with technology and understanding new media and understanding the way new media transforms media environments. So when I say we're in an era that's like the Protestant Reformation, I mean this very literally. The Protestant Reformation was a complete transformation of European culture that was technological and religious, but they were inseparable. The religious transformation of European culture in the Protestant Reformation was made possible materially by the rise of the printing press and movable type, and therefore mass accurate printing at a much cheaper cost than writing had ever been available. So that technological revolution at the deepest level of thought, which is thought itself symbolically represented, the way we represent thought symbolically is in writing. So when we have inscribed symbols and there is a revolution in the way in which we inscribe symbols, there's a revolution in thinking and there's a revolution in society. And there's a revolution in religion, which we can think of in this sense as the deepest core of sort of the human concern about the existence of their life, the meaning of their existence, how it's connected to the existence of the cosmos, of the gods. So religion in this general sense is, let's just say, it's sort of the core concerns humans have about their own meaning and the meaning of their environments and their worlds. And that's basically like what philosophy has meant through much of antiquity. So in order to understand our own moment, we have to understand it in a historical context. And that historical context is absolutely epochal, technological, and therefore religious and cultural transformation. So Martin Luther did not intend to start the so-called Reformation. He catalyzed it by writing the 95 Theses and all he did was he wrote out some arguments and posted them in public. And this was completely normal in the European intellectual world of his time, is you would post a sort of set of arguments in public, and then someone could respond and set up a public debate. So even though they had a very well-developed university system, there was still a culture of public argument that people could participate in, or at least listen in on, even if some of it was technical. And much of what I'll discuss is technical because this is a very complicated subject, and I make no apology for that. This is not the, an introduction to philosophy, but that doesn't mean you have to study philosophy. If you find what I'm saying interesting, it's fine. If you don't understand a lot of the details, frankly, it could be a good introduction to, you know, further study of philosophy. 
But this issue of where we're going culturally is a question that we have to think about in terms of what is happening technologically. And so I believe because we have the internet, it has completely transformed the nature of writing and speech. And how has it done that? Very simply, the internet has created a new oral age. So it is the reversal of the Reformation in one sense or a sublimation of it in another. It's a reversal in the sense that the Reformation built a world of religious and intellectual concerns on print and reading. So images were still very important, but that was a continuation of the importance of images from the Middle Ages. What was new was the transformation of the context of images in a print-based culture. Well, look around you. I mean, right, we're on the internet, we're on YouTube. Even very intellectual people like my colleagues in the world of academia would tell you, and they tell each other, we are all honest about it, people read less today. Even people whose entire job is centered around books, they read less. And we read less because our technological environment makes the meaning and the significance of traditional forms of reading different. Not irrelevant, but the meaning is different. If the entire context around you changes from the earth to the ocean, you could say that you're in the same place, but you're not. Environment matters. Context matters. So I think we've got to return to a form of philosophy in which, yes, people should have their professional institutions. It's good to want to get paid for teaching. I believe in all of that stuff. I have a Greek philosophy course you can you can purchase you know, for $35 and listen to. So I believe in sort of finding ways to make money for the value that intellectuals add in culture. But I also believe so much of the value of, of the intellectual life is the joy of it. And that's a joy that should be available to everyone. And so I think a balance between doing rigorous scholarly publication, I have a book in which I have very scholarly forms of the arguments that I'm gonna make, and that book will come out in a few years. So I'm committed to all of that, but I don't think that should in any way be in tension with actually speaking directly to the public in a way that is as accessible as possible. Because I think these arguments matter. I think Heidegger matters, and quite frankly, I think my own work matters, or I wouldn't be talking. Um, because the only reason we should all learn is because we think learning is valuable to us. But I think things that are valuable should also be enjoyable, and so I love philosophy. So that's why I'm doing this course in this way. Now I want to transition, having given a basic overview of the topic of the course and its importance and the format of the course online, I want to transition to a sort of discussion of Heidegger and the argument. And so this will be in basically two sections. I'm going to talk a little bit about Heidegger and I'm going to talk about him in terms of the major themes um, that structure his life. And I'm going to talk about the major areas that you really need to have an understanding of, which I'll discuss as the course develops, um, which are sort of my own distinctive contribution to this topic. There's a lot of very good work on it. Um, people can ask questions if they want in the comments, and I can recommend books. But I'm going to tell you the angle that I think is very important and that many good scholars agree with. And then I'll present a summary of the argument. So that'll be the second part of this, where I talk about the significance of Zion and Zion. So... Who was Martin Heidegger? Martin Heidegger was a conservative, pious Roman Catholic from a relatively sort of lower middle class background, you could say, um, in an area of Germany that we think of, broadly speaking, as southern Germany. So there's two very big states next to each other, Baden and Württemberg, and there's a huge amount of German culture that's linked to that area in the Black Forest, so the Schwarzwald. Heidegger was raised in the Schwarzwald, in the town of Freiburg, a kind of little medieval town um, in the south of Germany. And his father was involved in sort of a kind of job doing manual labor for the local Catholic church. And his family was very devout and very pious. So this is deeply important. The first thing to know about Heidegger is that he is born in a context of deeply conservative Roman Catholicism in the 18, the era of the 1870s, 80s, which for those of you who are interested in the history of Catholicism, you know that's a time period associated with the first Vatican Council. So it's a very important transformations were occurring in Catholicism at the time that Heidegger was being born and raised. And those religious transformations are part of the tensions of his own life that he had to navigate and that eventually led him to formally renounce his adherence to Roman Catholic orthodoxy. But he starts off as a deeply devout Catholic. 
Now, he was interested very much in philosophy and theology from a young age, which in the context of his time and, and his Catholic upbringing meant scholastic theology, literally a form of Catholic theology that stands in direct continuity with Thomas Aquinas from the 13th century. In fact, because Heidegger was poor but intellectually gifted, he received scholarships, and some of the scholarships were specifically from Thomistic centers to provide funding for people who would specialize or have a special interest in the study of Thomas Aquinas. And Aquinas was becoming, through the First Vatican Council in particular and related um, church declarations, he was becoming the sort of central representative of Catholic philosophy or Catholic theology in the modern world. So Heidegger was raised, first of all, as a devout Roman Catholic. Secondly, as a very gifted student, very interested in philosophy and theology from a very young age and very committed to understanding and studying the orthodox Catholic form of philosophy and theology that he was exposed to. Now, that's, you could say, phase one of Heidegger's life, is he's very interested in truth, he's very interested in um, God, and he's very interested in eternity. So he's also interested in math. He studies math in the university. But Heidegger has a very tumultuous, you know, late adolescent and teen years. And if you want to read his biography, you can see about his relationship to the war. He never ended up um, serving in combat. He had a complicated uh, health history and apparently some issues people think might have been heart issues. But Heidegger initially was going to be a priest. So this pious upbringing was so significant for him that his intellectual interests and his religious interests led him to want to be a Catholic priest. But he eventually renounced this in his early 20s. And the transition from Heidegger's devout Catholicism, you have to understand if you're not a religious person, it's like losing a world. But Heidegger gradually began losing his Catholic world. He began losing a world that was very anti-modern, very consciously anti-modern. So if modernity meant progress, Catholicism for Heidegger meant tradition, religion meant tradition. If modernity meant reason, then religion meant faith for Heidegger. If modernity meant time and history and dynamism and change, then religion for Heidegger meant stability, permanence, right? And, and eternity itself was for the early Heidegger his central value. But as he was exposed to contemporary German philosophy and theology, as is very normal, that is, as he became aware of the broader context that he had been so critical of as a devout apologetic Catholic, he became increasingly influenced by the dominant forms of uh, philosophy in his own day. And those aren't relevant for our purposes. It's quite technical, but basically the dominant forms of philosophy in Heidegger's day was neo-Kantianism, a movement that was based on a revival of the significance of Immanuel Kant, the great late 18th century German philosopher, founder of German idealism. Neo-Kantianism revived Kant's philosophy and particularly argued that it was central to securing a unique place for modern philosophy as essentially the theorizer of the sciences and how they work and how they're logically and philosophically grounded. At the same time that you have Neo-Kantianism, which was broadly speaking a very scientifically oriented philosophy, um, you also had a very deep, you could say, movement of a much more inspired existential form of philosophy, broadly called Lebensphilosophie. And the two crucial figures in the Lebensphilosophie movement from the 19th century were Arthur Schopenhauer, the great Western pessimist um, and of the mid 19th century, and then Friedrich Nietzsche, the great prophet of the apocalypse of European culture and the intertwinement of Platonism and Christianity that Nietzsche saw as the essence of Western civilization and the collapse of that intertwinement he saw as bringing about the death of God. So this is just, again, that's just very quick background. Obviously, one could lecture whole seminars on those topics, but this is very important to understand the background of Heidegger's thought. So this is a very intense period of time. Really, it's academic philosophy is in its culmination. Academic philosophy is only about 100 years old in the respectable way that we know it. Immanuel Kant is the first great canonical philosopher of Western history to be a university professor. Even most of the early modern philosophers who are canonical in universities today, like Descartes, Hobbes, they were not university professors, and they did not agree with the mainstream university philosophy. 
So Heidegger's context was a context in which both academic philosophy and you could say broader cultural philosophy were influencing each other. Um, and even you could say it's the more popular forms of philosophy, they were very academically rigorous by our own standards today. So it was a very alive time. And at the same time that philosophy was bubbling over with so much incredible excitement and also crisis in the religious world, as it brought in for Heidegger from conservative Catholicism to the world of mainstream German culture, and that means liberal Protestantism, in that world of liberal Protestantism, there were enormously exciting things happening. So this is part of the context. So Heidegger's moving out of his conservative upbringing and basically a very traditional form of radically conservative Christian orthodoxy that has continuity, quite frankly, with the Middle Ages and even the early church. Very traditional, very pious. And then from that, he's sort of blasted into the late 19th, early 20th century, the time of the greatest intellectual ferment possibly ever in the past 2000 years of European culture, because all of that culture is being self-consciously sifted and assimilated to the despair or jubilation of Heidegger's generation, right? Because you have to remember as Heidegger's coming of age, the war is happening, Spengler's Decline of the West comes out in the middle of World War One. The first volume becomes a completely unexpected bestseller. Over 100,000 copies of Spengler's intensely pessimistic book come out, where Spengler's arguing that we're at the end of the cultural epoch of Western civilization and that Europe is entering its death throes. So there is a, uh, there's a pessimism and there is a concern about the existence of life that is not just represented in philosophy, but it is widespread in culture. It is in history, in Spengler, and it's in literature. You see it, for example, in the great work of that period by Hermann Hesse, Damien. At the end of Damien, there's an incredible passage where it says uh, Damien is speaking about this world where something new is breaking in. There's this religious kind of apocalyptic messianic sense of inbreaking at the end of the novel. And the inbreaking is partly represented, as Damien says, by the fact that this world wants to die and it will. This world wants to die and it will. Heidegger was coming of age. He was sort of coming to be my age in his, his late 20s, early 30s, in a time of unbelievable existential dread and horror and excitement and thrill. And this is, in a way, what the Weimar era very broadly, the, the German political system that also stands for more, as I use it, the cultural epoch of the Weimar era, a period of just incandescent creativity. But it is the kind of creativity you also see represented in Thomas Mann's great short story or novella, Death in Venice. It is an incandescence that is also born of a kind of, a, a kind of necrosis, the sort of last lush, sort of explosion of energy, the sort of sexual orgiastic engulfing that occurs moments before one is snuffed out of existence. That's the energy of the Weimar era, right? That's the energy that you're getting in a very contained, controlled way and in such masterful perfection in Fitzgerald in The Great Gatsby. But in Europe, it's full tilt. In Europe, there is none of the American optimism um, in the 1920s. The 1920s, by this point, uh, in Europe is a time of intense, intense crisis, especially in the German world because of the defeat. And as the German world was defeated militarily, for many young people, that military defeat was also defeat of their cultural parents and the sort of stuffy representatives of a kind of liberal and liberal democratic Wilhelmine sort of German empire. So socialism was becoming far more appealing, far more powerful, social democracy, communism is becoming far more powerful. Basically, every radical ideological, philosophical, religious movement is being entertained at this period in history. And this is crucial to understand because Heidegger is not a professor in the modern kind of sense of just a guy in a school. Heidegger is caught up by virtue of his very historical moment in the death throes and also the existential aim paying for rebirth in European culture. And so as Heidegger is part of this, so he becomes a shaper of it. And so understanding this basic background from Orthodox Catholicism and eternity to a radical immersion in the whirlwind of history, of the dynamic concern for the meaning of time, and crucially, 
Heidegger falls under the sway of one of the greatest of the Southwestern neo-Kantians named Wilhelm Diltai. Diltai is a figure of incomparable depth who almost no one reads today. His work is very difficult in a certain sense. Much of it is not translated, and most of his most important work is not translated. Indeed, his most important early work, called the Einleitung in die Geistenwissenschaften, or the Introduction into the Human Sciences, only the first volume is translated, but the second volume is what is most intellectually consequential for Heidegger himself and his own generation, and that has never been translated into English. But Heidegger comes under the influence of Diltai, and what that means in a very simplistic sense from an introductory standpoint is he comes under the influence of, frankly, I think the greatest philosophical historian who has ever lived. Diltai had both an immensely sophisticated and profound knowledge of philosophy in every technical academic sense, because he was an elite member of the neo-Kantian academic guild, which was frankly just an intellectually astoundingly impressive group of philosophers, um, and far more impressive in just the intellectual range, their acquaintance with the natural and human sciences than any modern academic discipline, and certainly modern academic philosophy, which tends to be unfortunately frightfully narrow in its understanding of other academic fields. So Heidegger comes under the influence of Diltai, who has all of this knowledge, but to this knowledge he combines an incredibly intense and profound intimacy with the details of history and the way in which meaning in history emerges from the very specific context of people's lives and their feelings and their interpretations of themselves. And so this made Diltai an absolutely brilliant biographer of philosophers and theologians and poets. For example, if you love German romanticism, uh, Diltai wrote a wonderful book, uh, a series of books and essays on people like Novalis, you know, and I, 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 I might be in English, I actually don't know, I just realized I've only read it in German, but I think that's in English. So there's stuff that is you can find from him. And if you're interested in the history of literature, the history of education, philosophy of social science, Diltai is someone worth looking into. We don't, again, he's not very unfortunately well read in our own time and, and that's probably the translation but he is so important that if a person doesn't have a personal understanding of Diltai's importance which frankly most scholars don't which is fine but if you don't have a personal understanding of Diltai's importance you cannot situate Heidegger's work because Heidegger's work Zion in Sight the second word in the title is time and as everyone knows who studied Heidegger or read about Heidegger or done anything with Heidegger a, f a fundamental concern of Heidegger, at least in his early mature work in Sign and Sight, is with temporality. And in order to understand that in its context, and also to understand how it is and isn't significant or original, one has to understand that everyone was obsessed with this in Heidegger's time, because the generation before him have been doing some of the most brilliant work in history that has ever been done. And not just in history philosophically, but in like the history of early Christianity, the history of Judaism, the history of Gnosticism, the history of all of these deep and apocalyptic movements and metaphysical patterns that have shaped the development of Western Jewish, Christian, Islamic cultural history for the past 2000 plus years. So this was a time of immense literal apocalypticism, both in the culture, apocalypticism in the academy, and a literal rise of studies that are apocalyptic in their content or nature. Just to give one other example of Heidegger's time, in the before 1910, I think in 1906 or seven, but I'm, I can't remember, um, you have published the greatest sort of synthetic work and also in a way original argument of modern New Testament scholarship in the 20th century, which was uh, a study of the history of the life of Jesus. So starting from a, particularly the 18th century, Christian scholars and academics had tried to write historical accounts of who Jesus was. This is extremely important in Western culture. And this movement, you could say, reached its peak in the 19th century, where it began to be criticized, but it was still very influential. But Albert Schweitzer, an absolutely brilliant polymath musician, he became a medical missionary. Um, he was an extraordinary person, but his first sort of great career was as a scholar. And he wrote this massive history of the scholarship of the life of Jesus. And its conclusions were profoundly pessimistic in one sense about our ability to access a historical figure like Jesus through academic study. And at the same time, they were profoundly alluring at the level of a kind of mystical or apocalyptic yearning because Schweitzer's interpretation of Jesus and his preaching of the kingdom of God was a very apocalyptic um, interpretation and it had enormous influence. It goes back to the 19th century. 
to uh, German biblical scholars who I can't get into now. But this is, you could say, what does this matter to Heidegger? And this is, again, something I want to stress. German intellectual culture to this day, but especially at this period of time, was never as parochial or as provincial as um, English-speaking Anglophone culture is, whether in America, and arguably we're the most provincial because it's less common, uh, even in American history, for many educated Americans to be regularly reading in other languages, whereas in England, it, it's pretty common in the uh, the professional upper classes of England intellectually that people would read French and and maybe some other languages. But still, it is true that broadly speaking, e even the English world is like the American world in comparison with uh, Germany at this time in this sense. The average German philosopher was someone who was extraordinarily well-read in and deeply interested in religion and cultural history and a wide variety of disciplines. And there's specific cultural reasons for this. One of them, broadly speaking, is the tradition of Bildung in education, which is a tradition that goes back to the 19th century, which really creates as an ideal the image of cultivation, that you cultivate your mind and your intellect. So being in a way deeply appreciative of a lot of art and deeply appreciative of culture and deeply appreciative of history, there's a reason German culture produced that so powerfully. And it's partly because people actually argued for this as an ideal and they embodied it in their life in the 19th century and they shaped the university culture. So that's important because in the West today, it's very uncommon for people who are secular to know a great deal about religion and it's uncommon for people who are religious to understand deeply so-called secular culture. So it's hard for us to imagine an era in which you have secularity and you have radically different forms of religiosity, but they genuinely are interested in each other. They, they are reading each other. You know, people are reading communists at the same time they're reading radical, you know, right-wing conservatives at the same time they're reading poetry at the same time they're listening to experimental music like Schoenberg. This was normal. And it seems very, you know, hoity-toity to a kind of sensibility of an American. But truthfully, it's just a really exciting, intellectually saturated time period. So Heidegger basically represents then the transition of not just himself, but a whole generation from living under the auspices of an old world of traditional religion and eternity. Karl Barth comes from a similar world. Protestants are not quite as medieval you could say and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense but not quite as ancient in its piety but still from a similarly conservative world so many of the movers and shapers and theology and philosophy of this day they come from this conservative European world and then they go to the university and they sort of become exposed for themselves to the thrilling excitement and terror of their own cultural moment and they want a piece of the action so Heidegger wanted a piece of the action now, I'm not obviously giving an intellectual overview of Heidegger's life in this course. That's its own subject. Probably the best source for that is um, Rudiger Safransky's biography, which is uh, originally in German and translated into English. But it's, it's a very excellent book for getting a readable overview of his life that is extremely attentive to the structure and character of his thought and provides a very respectably uh, serious uh, argument in its own right about Heidegger's philosophical ideas and development. So that I would recommend that if someone's interested in that. So, but let me now get to Heidegger and his actual work. So Heidegger, up to 1927, um, he is a student of Edmund Husserl, who is the great founder of the movement we know as phenomenology. Husserl's thought is, again, frankly, extremely complex and very difficult. And uh, there is a ton of literature on Heidegger and Husserl, so there's absolutely no reason anyone who's interested in that can't find it for themselves. Um, it's very unclear how the best way to teach the relationship between Heidegger and Husserl is because the proper way to do that methodologically is itself massively difficult, which would theoretically require you have a pretty good independent interpretation of both Husserl's work up to the time of Heidegger's major work and Heidegger's major work, and then you would want to coordinate those two interpretations. But that's very difficult because they're both very complicated thinkers, and normally people only specialize in one of them anyway, even if they are deeply... Um, broadly read in phenomenology. So I frankly think that's almost a, it, it's almost a pipe dream to expect that, but you'll see there's a lot of scholarship on what is Heidegger's relationship to his role. Um, only when I think it's absolutely essential to explicating something in Zion Insight will I make any reference to Husserl, not because he's unimportant, but because he's too important to invoke casually.
So Husserl, however, this is just one of the bad things about Heidegger. Husserl was Jewish. He was an enormous influence um, on Heidegger and helped him get uh, a job. And uh, when the time of the Nazis came, Heidegger, who had dedicated Sein und Zeit to Husserl, withdrew, if I remember this correctly, that dedication during the time of the war. Um, and he didn't protect Husserl from the legislation that removed Jews from their posts in the university. So it's very unfortunate, very impious, ultimate relationship to his mentor, but they were very close and, and there's a very deep connection that if you want to understand Heidegger, and frankly, if you want to understand Heidegger's anti-Semitism, uh, you, you really have to think very deeply about his personal relationship, even at a psychological level, to Husserl. But that's biography, not per se philosophy. So what then is Sign and Sight, broadly speaking, in relationship to Martin Heidegger and his career, and what is the nature of the work? Well, Martin Heidegger had to get a work out because the job opportunity came up and he needed a book to be eligible for the job. So he put together a bunch of the stuff he'd been working on in lectures for throughout the 1920s, by which point he had already become very famous. He was, had a kind of subterranean reputation as a very mystical and alluring and charismatic teacher. So he put together this kind of, essentially he thought incomplete, but two-thirds complete manuscript uh, Senate. It was published in Heidegger's, I mean, Husserl's journal, um, and it got him the job. So basically it's a funny story in a way, which is Dine Insight came out when it did because Heidegger had to publish a book to get a job. So academic philosophy sort of at its best and worst. Now, the nature of the book is um, itself deceptively simple and therefore strangely often passed over, which is Heidegger is extremely direct about what the nature of the book is. This is the book in the standard edition. It's through reading it in this edition, the German edition, that I came to the argument very early in my graduate work that led to my dissertation about this. But in the book, uh, Heidegger is explicitly clear about the purpose of the study, which I'll read to you if I can find it. Um, but the very first uh, title of the introduction it gives you the theme of the work. Uh, the title says... Die Exposition der Frage nach dem Sinn von Sein. Now that is similar to what he says in the beginning on the first page, where he has a quote from uh, Plato in Greek. And then he says, Haben wir heute eine Antwort auf die Frage nach dem, was wir mit dem Wort Seien eigentlich meinen, which roughly translated as this. Do we today have an answer to the question of what we actually mean by the word being? The participle being, Zayent in German. So that is the subject of the book. And then he has this sentence, Die konkrete Ausarbeitung der Frage nach dem Sinn von Sein, in quotes, von Sein, ist die Absicht der folgende Abhandlung. Again, rough uh, little translation. The concrete working out of the question of the Sinn von Sein. I'm going to use that phrase in German but I'll translate it over and over again so you remember what it is. Zin here you can think of having the sense of sense. The sense of sein in quotation marks is, is the purpose of the following manual book, essay, study, contribution. So in a working out of the question of the sense of sein. Now, now here we come to the first very important point. There is a big difference between the word sein and the word seient. Seient is the German participle form of to be. It's the word being as a participle. So if you have to review your grammar, don't worry. It's totally fine. I didn't learn grammar properly until I studied foreign languages. Um, but you can look this up. I'm not going to go through the grammar itself. I'm going to just use the terms, okay? But please don't worry if you need to pause it or just look this up. So... Sein is, in grammatical terms, the German infinitive, which is the equivalent of the English to be. Now, we cannot use the English phrase to be as a noun. It sounds, it's a kind of solecism. We don't say the to be. Some people have said that, but it's frankly, it's too ugly, okay? This is very weird. And this is going to get immediately into my translation 
of this text and why I read the text and in my scholarship in the book that I'm writing and finishing, all of the translations that I use are my own because unfortunately the text is not well rendered right now in English because the central ideas don't get rendered consistently um, because they haven't been understood because they're very hard. So it's no one's fault, but the simple fact is they're not understood. So sein, meaning to be, is the title word, sein und Zeit. Now, in German, just like in most other languages, including Latin and Greek and basically every other European language, the infinitive form of a word is a single word. It's not to plus a word, like to be, to run. So this is very unusual. The English infinitive requires two words, which means we can't nominalize our infinitives. Nominalizing an infinitive is literally just turning the infinitive into a noun. So das sein um, is a noun form of to be. So literally, if you translated it in this ridiculously literal way in English, it would be the to be. So German can do that. So does Latin does it. Latin doesn't have articles, but Latin will just say essay. And authors can use it essentially as a noun, or they can use it as a, as a verb. Same in Greek. You can literally do it in Greek with any of the genders. The common sort of neutral form, taenai, is the equivalent of das sein, or essay in Latin. Okay, and letra in French, and on and on and on in the other European languages. So English is the outlier. And this outlier has great significance in the translation of philosophy, particularly metaphysics. It's, it's, it's so hugely important, it's strange, it's not more talked about. So English is the only Western language that I have any familiarity with in which you cannot make a distinction between the participle form of to be, being, and any other form. And the reason for that, of, of the same word, and the reason for that is because we can't nominalize are to be now. And you can say, Sam, what in the world does that mean? And why does it matter? Okay. Good question. Good question. So first of all, when Heidegger says that the purpose of the book, or part of the question the book is answering is he said, have we forgot? Do we today have an answer to the question? What is the sense of Zion? Heidegger is asking about the sense of the, the whole concept of Zion as a noun, as a verb. What does it mean to be okay he explicitly systematically distinguishes his concern with sein from his use of the term zion which is literally translated in english as being so now maybe you're seeing the problem the title of being in time is not das der or die seiende und zeit which would be literally translated as something like the being, or you could just say sein und Zeit, being in time. That is not what it says. Now you could say, Sam, it's very normal to translate the infinitive to be when it's in a nominal form by being in English. Yes, that's true. I'm not saying it's always wrong. However, I would have a separate argument about why it generally is wrong. Certainly, I think it should be indicated in the bracket that there's the original word being used. Why is it so misleading in Heidegger's case? Well, first of all, because within the first pages of Heidegger's book, he makes a distinction between sein und seinde. Sein and being. Because the English translations translate the word sein as being, they cannot make that most elementary distinction in Heidegger's own vocabulary. So what do you get? In the English translations, the convention is to translate the word sein typically with a capital B, as if it's some big thing, being. And then to translate essentially any form of zayanda, or being, the participle, that is the verbally active idea of the concept, as being za, which is extremely confusing. First of all, it's grammatically unjustified and unjustifiable. One, because German can make a distinction between the singular being as a participle, seiend, or seiend, and beings, seienden. So German can make the being beings distinction, and Heidegger uses it sometimes, but because any form of that participle is translated as a lowercase beings, it's extremely confusing to know what Heidegger is saying in crucial technical words. They're not, represent they're not representable 
they're not just not represented, they cannot be represented in the system of translation that is currently operative in Heidegger scholarship, okay? Secondly, the proper word literally is being, but it cannot be used because being has been used to translate the infinitive and its nominalized form, sein. So now you could say, well, that should have been a reason to maybe think perhaps we shouldn't just rush to being, at least in this case with this guy Heidegger, to translate the word sein. And you could say, why are you concerned about this? I would tell you this. If you're not interested in this, that's totally fine. But this is literally what Heidegger's whole life was about. The, the sense of the term sein. So we're starting in a very technical, exact way with the sense of the term sein. Because I just think sometimes we scholars are over clever and we don't want to just do a very basic thing like what the hell does this word mean? Because <laughs> people, it's basic stuff is very hard. So knowing what a philosopher means by basic words, what does Plato mean by idea or morphe, right? Or what does Aristotle mean by tatiane enai? These are the essentially the greatest questions of philosophy. So I don't think they're insignificant linguistic questions. I think they're really kind of important questions. So so sorry, I'm looking at that down at the text here. So, so let me get back to you in this very direct way and, and tell you where we're at. So where we're at is that Heidegger writes this book under the shadow of, in a way, a massive cultural shift that he represents from the conservative world of Orthodox Christianity and traditional cultural values in eternity into a world of change, a world of time and a world of apocalypse. And Heidegger wants to write a book whose purpose is to expound the sense of the meaning of the term sein. So we're going to leave this open. And he says, the exposition der Frage nach dem Sinn von sein. So that's the subject of the book, the exposition of the question of the sense of sein. And that's the first part of the book, the introduction. And he begins that section with a very crucial passage, which is alluding to Kierkegaard's concept of repetition, called Die Notwendigkeit einer ausdrücklichen Wiederholung der Frage nach den Sein, which is a, uh, uh, the necessity of essentially an ex a sort of thorough and express repetition of the question of Sein. So that's, of course, translates the question of being. Now, at this point, the question is, why does this question matter? And what is Heidegger's angle on it? And by answering those two questions, I will then give you the answer to the question, how do I translate the title of the book? And what is the course of my argument? And where is it going to take us? So Heidegger's concern and his unique part, which is in the, the very beginning part I read from, is to inquire into the question of their Sinn von Sein, under the horizon, he says, of time and specifically of temporality. So, first of all, Heidegger's topic, Sein, is metaphysics. And I'll get into this in subsequent lectures, but the subject of metaphysics, properly speaking, in the interpretation framework Heidegger's from, particularly as a scholastically trained Catholic theologian, his framework is Zion has is the proper object of the special study of metaphysics. This is based on a certain reading, deeply controversial, deeply influential, of crucial passages in Aristotle's metaphysics. What you need to know is, first of all, that the discipline of metaphysics is a later name for something that in Plato and Aristotle is called theology. Okay, I'll discuss this in the next lecture but this is a fact. So metaphysics names something that originally was called theology. Secondly, and I would argue very easily, frankly, because of that first fact. Secondly, there is a crucial ambiguity that plagues the entire history of metaphysics as to whether its proper object is being or sein or essay or God, or if both under one under the aspect of the other. That is, is the proper study of metaphysics God, but perhaps under the aspect of being? Or is the proper study of metaphysics being, but perhaps under the aspect of God? Or is there a difference between theology and metaphysics based on that? There is a very long tradition of subtle thinking about that in the Catholic intellectual world specifically, but more broadly in the whole world of Christian theology. There's an enormous tradition of thought about this question, and that is simply one form of a thought that is just 
the, the lifeblood of Platonism from its inception. So this means that Heidegger's topic is from the beginning ambiguous as to its actual content. It is explicitly metaphysical and that means explicitly ambiguous as to the question of God. So the question of God is already being raised implicitly by the subject matter of the book and Heidegger knows perfectly well that metaphysics traditionally culminates in God. He pretends he doesn't, but he knows it better than almost anyone in our time does because he was literally trained in the Catholic philosophical scholastic tradition. So he knows that in traditional classical metaphysics, the proper object of metaphysics is God, regardless of whether it's also being. There's no question it's God. So to understand then Zeinun Sight, you have to understand that from the beginning, it is a double movement, an overt movement on the surface of the metaphysical action concerning the question of the sense of Zein, what we represent in English as being in the current translations. At the same time, it is a sub rosa inquiry into the stability and possibility of contact between the question of Zein, being, and the question of God or divinity. And this is the question and the ambiguity that undergirds and animates Heidegger's entire life. It is why he feels so religious, because he is. But he essentially ends up pouring his own religious feeling into his own idiosyncratic philosophy, making it very much like ancient philosophy, which is he pretends that it's um, sort of the proper deliverance of a German academic professor. And yet at the same time, he's very self-conscious that he's unlike other professors and that he very much wants to be special and that he views himself as a world historical individual. So that is what he's doing in inquiring into the sense of Zion, part one. Part two then is the horizon of temporality. Why does that matter? Very simple. Because the horizon of Zion for all of history since it's been studied in the Western philosophical tradition, that is the horizon of theology, is the world of eternity. The Greek gods are the athanatoi, the undying ones, the immortals. And the link between divinity and deathlessness, and divinity and specifically eternity, timelessness, okay, specifically eternity, not as the negation of time, but as the fullness of what time converges towards and derives from. This is the Platonic view. Plato says that time is the moving image of eternity in the Timaeus. So the horizon of God and the horizon of the ultimate question of metaphysics properly understood in the metaphysical tradition is, you could say, almost grammatically necessary to be eternity. Heidegger is self-consciously subverting and reversing the entire metaphysical tradition by taking its subject matter, the sense of that infinitive to be, but utterly reversing the framework, which is the assumption that in inquiring in what it means to be, one is also inquiring in the nature of the primordial everlastingness of whatever it is that is and doesn't become, whatever is eternal and doesn't become subject to change in time. So that's what Heidegger is doing, is he's reversing the horizon of traditional metaphysics and theology while retaining its subject matter. The result is what I call a form of inverted Platonism. So I'll discuss inverted Platonism in the context of metaphysics in the next couple lectures. And now I want to close with the answer to the question, what then is the proper translation of Zion and Sight? Well, I'm going to give you the full argument in the following lectures. But here is a hint. And it was my attempt to translate this passage in 2000, I think, 12 or 13 in a seminar with Karsten Harries at Yale, a great uh, German-American professor. But he, he was one of the last people in America who kind of he knew Gadamer. I think he had met Heidegger once. And he represented a wonderfully deep teaching tradition of the German tradition at Yale. And I wrote uh, a paper on Sign and Sight, and I was translating a passage. And the passage, roughly speaking, says that the essence of Dasein, which we'll get to, us, or seemingly the thing that Heidegger analyzes us through, the essence of Dasein is in existence. And Heidegger uses the phrase 
existence and essence, which goes back to a very old metaphysical distinction. And the existence-essence distinction is the basis of existentialism. That's why Heidegger was so sensitive about being identified with it, because he was very rightly identified with existentialism. And the reason Heidegger was rightly identified with existentialism is because Sein and Sight is a philosophy book, which is essentially also a work of religion, which is not incompatible. Ancient philosophers were religious figures, which is an exposition of Heidegger's interpretation of the meaning of existence. Existence. Specifically as a concept, existence. Specifically as an entity, Dasein. And specifically under the general aspect of the term Sein. So when he says that das Sein does Dasein, the Sein of Dasein lies in its existence, and the essence of Dasein lies in its existence. This is a central claim that led me to eventually realize, oh, what Heidegger is talking about in this passage, in the introduction, is existence. And he's focusing specifically on existence as opposed to essence, Wesen. Wesen und Existenz is the exact German equivalent typically used of the Latin essay or essentia and essay or essence and existence. So Heidegger's inquiry is into Sein, the traditional subject of theology or metaphysics, under the aspect of time, a reversal of the traditional horizon of eternity. And instead of focusing on the question of essences, Heidegger's interpretation of the traditional form of metaphysics and theology, he is focusing on Sein as existence and what it means. But Heidegger's answer to the question of the sense of Sein should culminate when one understands it philosophically in a rendering of the English title of the book as existence and time. That came to me first in his paper. I had a friend who was like, dude, you should write a dissertation on that. It wasn't my interest. I didn't like Heidegger very much. I just thought he's very important. I still don't like him very much. I still think he's very important. So I did uh, write a dissertation on that and other things. And that is the sort of central fact that emerges. But it means nothing. That's why I don't just share it. One, because people have already stolen my work when I was in grad school, as has happened to many academics, and people do steal each other's work. It's very sad. So I didn't share it in general, but two, because you have to have the argument. And to have the argument, you have to understand the connection between Heidegger, German idealism, Kierkegaard, medieval scholastic theology, and Plato and Aristotle. And that's what I'm going to lay out in the subsequent lecture course, is I'm going to give you just the bare background, which I give a lot of detail of in my book. I'll give you the bare background in one or two lectures of what I do in three chapters in a book, um, and then I'll focus on an exposition of some of the key ideas in Sign and Sight. So thank you very much for joining me. Um, I hope you'll join me next time.